I'm going to tell you how good God's been. No, I'm going to tell you how good God's been. Well, he won't be up this morning to start me on my way. I'm going to tell you how good God's been. <laughs> hey, family, good morning, good afternoon, and welcome to my Sunday morning sermon, Mental Health Edition. How y'all doing? How y'all doing? Well, I hope all is well in your world. Um, I hope most of us have gotten through this weekend without somebody in our families being uh, desecrated or assassinated. Um, but for those of us in the family who have, my condolences go out to you. My, my heart felt sympathy go to you. And um, let's just keep praying that uh, God awakens a sleeping giant in our community because um there's just so much that we need to take responsibility and ownership of um and um there's so many of us in my humble opinion who have been utterly driven mad that uh you know we we we're going to have to come to the realization that you know only a god can fix them but in the meantime, we can't allow them to pray off others. Okay, but with that being said, with that being said, <clears throat> um, my conversation tonight is I had to get into it because I got a lot of upset people when I did the video about Reverend James Cleveland. Y'all got so mad at me that it took a minute for me to, um, you know, really get to address some of the uh, comments. However, I will, and I hope to be able to do a live stream about this. Matter of fact, I'm going to do a poll as soon as I vote, and I'm going to let y'all tell me uh, if we should do uh, um, uh, you know, a survey. Do a survey of when, if we should do a live about this, because in my opinion, it's so many people in our community in denial. It is so many people. So, and and what am I talking about? Um, Our Lady of the Roses uh, made a comment June 30th, 1984. She said, any country that allows homosexuals to roam and to seduce the young shall be destroyed. <laughs> okay? Now, I want you to remember that. <clears throat> now, According to my knowledge, has been all gay people all through time. This is not a new phenomenon. However, most of y'all want to act like it is. Okay? And like I said in so many other uh, videos, most people that are considered, I'd like to say, same-sex relationships or um, non-conforming gender-loving relationships, I... um have noticed that most of them have kids. So now, how do you talk about that? Is there just black and white, or is there a gray area here? Because all the choir directors I ever knew growing up, they would you uh, uh, would be termed a sissy. Okay? So earlier this month, this is an interview I just just picked up, and I I just want to read it because I'm not too familiar with this uh, singer songwriter. I've heard some of her music, but I don't know her like I know with James Cleveland. Okay, but earlier anyway, an interview with Chris, Christianity Today singer songwriter Jennifer Knapp confirmed what a lot of people in contemporary Christian music have suspected since she ascended to popularity over a decade ago. She's gay. Since then, Knapp has continued to talk openly about coming out 
in Christian music, including an um, appearance on a TV show where she got caught between King and a fundamentalist preacher in what Candace Cello Hodge has not just unjustly described as an immoral debate about homosexuality. Um, that nap, as Hodge also notes, held her own in a debate in the debacle of a discussion that King blunderly uh, presided over is no surprise, given how def deftly she deflected the Christian Today interviewer's repeated attempts to describe her of coming out was as part of a larger struggle with homosexuality. She said, um, it never occurred to me um, that I was in something that should be labeled as a struggle, Knapp said. The struggle that I've had has been with the church acknowledging me as a human being. Did you hear that? The struggle that I have is with the Christian church that is labeled uh, me pretty much a thing. <laughs> uh, anyway, Knapp's response echoed that of another gay Christian singer, uh, the black gospel uh, performer, Tone, who came out in a television interview and uh, uh, have you st struggled with homosexuality is what the interview asked Tone. Um, and uh, uh, not struggle, Tone replied. It wasn't a struggle. Uh, it wasn't a struggle at all. It may be difficult for people unfamiliar with evangel evangelical popular culture to understand how and why this kind of thing matters so much. It's not because Tone and Nap are the first gay singers in Christian music. Well, at least as far back as the 1940s, the gospel guitarist Rosetta Thorpe was, as Gail Wilde noted in her excellent biography of Sister Rosetta, rumored to be something more than just friends, with the performer known as Sister Mary, Katie Marie. More prominently, James Cleveland's homosexuality was an open secret for most of his career and the last half of the 20th century. And the King of Gospel died in 1991 amidst rumors that he had infected a much younger man with HIV and that he himself had died of the AIDS-related complications. More recently, in 2004, the Southern Gospel tenor Kirk Talley was outed after FBI arrested a man who tried to blackmail Tally with indiscreet photos the singer had posted of himself on a gay chat site. In 2006, a photo of the songwriter and gospel music imperial Bill Gaither embracing the lesbian songwriter Marsha Stevens and her partner generated such blowback from Gaither fans that Gaither issued a public statement denouncing homosexuality and lamenting Stevens' sad life as a lesbian. Mm -mm -mm. What a hypocrite. Wow. In a, I mean, a few years later, in 2008, <clears throat> the soloist Ray Boltz, he came out after a long, successful career in CCM and inspirational music and a 33 year straight marriage citing the darkness of the closet and the torment of living a double life. Now, I, okay, the torment, did you hear that? Of living a double life. These are only the most famous examples. Not for nothing has Bishop Yvette Flounder said that gospel music is gay music. But it's not just gospel. 
from traditional black and Southern or white gospel to praise and worship and inspirational to contemporary Christian music. You can't swing a Dove Award, a Grammys of Christian entertainment without hitting upon evidence of the downtime, the line uh, to the piano players, backup singers, and other supporting musicians, choir directors, song leaders, songwriters, producers, and of course, managers. And of course, ordinary fans. I have been one of those fans, as long as I can remember growing up with what the playwright Dale Shores has called the Southern Baptist Sissy. A deeply closeted preacher kid who couldn't get enough of gospel music, whether listening to it, singing it, playing it on the church piano, or performing it on stage with others. For some time now, the thinking both within and from beyond the Christian music world has been that gay guys like me are attracted to the flamboyance of theatrically of Christian entertainment. Anthony Helbert was probably the most prominent voice to assert this theory in his landmark history of uh, <clears throat> the black gospel in 1971. <clears throat> there he wrote that since gospel is theatrical and the theater is the paradigm for much of the gay life, that gospel has a special allure for gays. Mm -hmm. Um, more than a few Orthodox Christian music insiders would agree with Hellebit. Many of them would probably also call for unflagging vigilance, lest the overabundance of homosexuals in Christian entertainment turn the Lord's music into Sodom and Gomorrah. Um, CPC and Levels are there. Um, Sodom and Gomorrah, the musical. <laughs> Tone's and Knapp's story stand out in the queer history of Christian music because they directly challenge this heterocentric vision of the misfit gay using the stage to sub sublimate his forbidden sexual proclivities. Openly gay and Christian, Tone and Knapp insist on the right to come out from among them. As the Apostle Paul put it in his letter to the early church at Corinth, be ye separate in ways that are truly um, of the totality of who you really are. In this way, they actively resist being inscribed into evangelism's punitive discourse of the self embattled homosexual. Now, my question is. If the tenant, the first tenant in the heart of the Christian tenant is to love, love. Now, how can you say and claim that when you are homophobic and you speak all manners of evil against people who um, are, homo are homosexual or gay? Um, I don't understand that concept. Now, I also don't understand the concept of defending people or getting angry because I made a video about a uh, gay um, James Cleveland. And it, just like the article said, I wasn't saying that to dog him out. I was really saying it. I'm saying because I think all this suppression behavior like this. And all these people coming out against people like this is the reason why diseases spread, is the reason why people have to be in the closet in the damn first place. And it's amazing to me how ignorant some people can be when they think gay people is going to rape their son, but they don't think it's just as damaging for a grown man to sleep with a nine-year-old. And they don't see that as pedophilia. 
and that just because a person is gay, it, if he's a, it does not uh, 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 um, automatically make him a pedophile. Okay, go get it. Um, thing there. Why is that hard? A hard concept to even deal with. I, to me, it seems so elementary. You know. But to some, it don't. It, they, they feel like if you're gay, you're going to rape their child and you have children. But you don't think that, that y- your child can be raped by a heterosexual person and and that if, they're, if they rape a child, that, that that's pedophilia behavior? Whether the person is gay or not, you don't put them two together as that person is just a pedophile? He may be a gay pedophile or not. And how do you explain people having children? How I mean, how how has sex become no gray area at all? I don't understand that. That people will actually, and then I have my interpretation. I have my opinion. I think that because a lot of, uh, especially in the in, in the black community, because that's what we're talking about, and they're the homophobic asses I believe a lot of them need somebody to hate because they hate it on so badly that you know it's like the hate the hate produces or you know if you beat a child he go to school and um, beat the kids up it's the same thing it's like they are hated up on so they figure let's hate up on the gay people in the gay community. Now, unless we use them as the organ player or the choir director. Now, you know that a whole different trip. Now, if we use them as the choir director or the lead singer and know they're gay as a ace of spade, then it's okay. Okay? Now, y'all see, do you see a problem with that? While the everyday living environment for gays and lesbians in America has improved considerably since Tharps and Cleveland's time, hmm, not in church, today the resistance within evangel- evan- evangelical popular culture toward non-heterosexuals may be, if anything, test intensifying in far more overt and punishing ways than in the past. While Cleveland dominated gospel music for two generations, Despite the open secret of his homosexuality, the only performers today who have been widely known to be gay while also maintaining a career as a Christian performer are self-described ex-gays. You know, such as Donnie McClurkin. So Donnie McClurkin was one of the lucky ones. You know, in in much less cosmopolitan world of Southern white gospel, the outdated tenor singer Kirk Talley submitted uh, himself to the regime of ex-gay reparative therapy under the supervision of respected industry leaders and prominent pastors. But music stores still pulled his product from their shelves. His concert schedule became a long list of cancellations and his music career continues to languish more than six years later. Boats has fared slightly better, uh, probably perhaps that he has eschewed his ex-gay path and focused on building a after-gay Christian fan base. I wouldn't be surprised if you can find a lot of his music deeply discounted in the must-go bin of your local Christian retailer. Even though I eventually came out and left the evangelism almost a half a lifetime ago, I confess that there are still times in my work as a scholar of American religious culture and a fan of Southern gospel when the overwhelming reality of evangelism and abiding apathy, uh, anti-apathy towards homosexuality become so claustrophobic that I want to seize on the story such as Knapp's and Tony's evidence of a fundamental recalibration in the threshold of tolerance for openly gay people in the world of Christian music. Yet, 
As much as I'd like to be right about this, the reality is that the faith, to me, is that um, the faith of professional Christian musicians who come out is mostly fixed the moment they speak their truth. Which is why no one I know expects a comeback from Tone or Nap in the Christian music. At some level, they both seem to acknowledge as much, releasing post-coming-out crossover albums aimed at such secular music because the gospel music don't want to hear it no more. R&B and hip-hop audiences as Christian music fans. Understood, then, within the wider context of contemporary evangelism, these coming out cases illustrate something less uplifting, but more important to any meaningful understanding of religion in American culture, namely that the more accepting secular society becomes of non-heterosexuals, the more aggressively protective evangelism is of its sense of itself as a haven for traditional values and life ways. Not least of all of them, an absolute prohibition, prohibition, I can't say the word, of homosexuality as defining feature of Christian as they practice it. Fortunately, as the song goes, as an old Bill Gates tune puts it, while the ideological center of evangelist culture may well hold steadfast in its opposition toward homosexuality for some, the time has come the critical mass of culture consensus against gays shrinks ever so slightly every time people like Tone and Nap insist publicly on being true to who they are. Without surrendering their stake in Christian music, and without surrendering themselves. And it's concerned with all alluring mysteries of the soul striving after grace and salvation. This, I think, is the true value of the sacred music of American uh, Protestantism. It's marvelous, incantatory, ever drawing capacity to transcend uh, orthodoxy's effort to control what it means, or to put limits on the redemptive work it accomplishes for all of those who find the key for their souls to sing in it the gospel. Um, now, some of these things that was made from this Our Lady of Roses, um, um, it, it, you know, like I said, it it is pretty homophobic, and it says things like, um, "Are you so blind that you do not recognize the acceleration of sin among you? Murders abound, three very all manner of carnage, destruction of young souls, abortion." Homosexuality condemned from the beginning of time by the eternal father. Yet, sin has become a way of life. Sin is condoned now, even unto the highest judge of your land and your lands throughout the world. You have sown, as you have sown, so shall you reap. Sin is death. What is that? Sin is death. Not only of the spirit, but of the body. And wars are a punishment for man's sin. His greed and his abhorrence. All right. So what y'all think? Um, the question has become, when you hear people say things um, about, you know, gospel singers 
and their how they out of how they identify or how they don't identify. Why is that a problem so much, especially in a organization or an entity that's supposed to be so in inundated with love? Okay. And not just love for um you know people that's like you but about your love for people that's different and do you think that if people could come out and be themselves about their sexuality do you think that it would be less tension and stress in the situation i don't know those are things i challenge y'all with those two questions because I think they're very important. Do you think that they were able to come out and be free about who they are? Would it be so re repressed? And if people would accept who they are, whether they agree with it or didn't like it or anything, it would be just like anything else. Like, like a lot of people don't like drunks. You know what I'm saying? But they don't try to keep the drunk, you know, unless he's drunk out of social circles and things of that nature. So what do you think about that? Let me know. So with that being said, that is the end of the Sunday morning sermon. <laughs> if you like what you hear, please like, subscribe, and share the channel. And I'm going to see you in the next video. God bless you.